Perfect. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we would like to begin. And I would like to very, very warmly welcome today's uh, honor guest, Mr. Tuomas Malinen uh, from Finland. Uh, Tuomas is the CEO and the chief economist at the GNS Economics, a Helsinki-based uh, macroeconomics uh, consultancy, and he's also an associate professor of economics. He has studied uh, economic growth and economic crisis uh, for over 10 years, and he has uh, a newsletter as well. Uh, he has other staffs, and I will talk about this in a, in a moment, but uh, among other things. Uh, he has also a newsletter where he deals with forecasting and uh, how to prepare for the recession and the upcoming crisis. Uh, I, was, uh, I was Googling your name and uh, I, I had the impression that uh, you either figured out a way to travel back in time and uh, really the same day over and over again because it's impossible how many articles are under your name, so how many articles you are writing and, uh, and publishing, and also in the last week, only in the last week, Google gave uh, more than 300 hits uh, when I was uh, looking for a name. Some of them were linked to this uh, event, so I was happy. Uh, and uh, and I was, I'm also happy that you had accepted our invitation and uh, you came uh, to talk about uh, some very interesting topics uh, with us. My very first question would be, what was your motivation. How have you decided to, to become an economist and not a doctor or a uh, physicist or, or anything else? Well, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, 300, 300 hits. Oh, wow. Well, you don't, I don't really have time to follow on those. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, um, that's an interesting question. I actually uh, pondered it a bit today, just before I came here. And I, um, it came to my mind that my um, ex-wife used to say, uh, she probably still says that, I'm a uh, real-life fox molder. I, I always have a mission. And I, uh, she's a doctor of psychology, and we were together for 20 years, so I, I think we you know, take her assessment on it. But uh, in, let's say, most uh, uh, rigorous words, uh, it actually, the, my path uh, to, uh, to the, uh, to, to the realms of economics, if you may, started uh, when I was 16 years old. I, um, for reasons, certain reasons, I weren't able to go to high school, so I actually went to commercial school. And a, uh, there was a teacher called Jussi Hiavonen, and he was really, really, you know, um, uh, what's it, exhilarating in, in teaching about economics. And at that moment, I knew that if I would go to university to study anything, it would be economics. I couldn't really explain it to me back then, why, why it was so important. But uh, there is something like, I like big abstract things and using my imagination to, you know, uh, to describe and to forecast things, to, to kind of let myself know how the things would proceed. And they... Uh, I don't think there are many research done on, on economists on their on their psyche, but I'm I'm kind of thinking that imagination is something, though let's say a vivid imagination is something we economists all have in common because you know simply you economics is so abstract and so difficult and so boring at times. So if you don't have that, you you are not going to make it. Thank you very much, and I really see the connection with uh, Fox uh, Mulder, uh, because this vivid imagination is, is also important. And he was one of my favorite characters, so if you don't know who's Fox Mulder, uh, then uh, you have to watch some X-Files. Uh, I really recommend it. Uh, uh, okay, uh, talking about the, the present times as well, and thank you very much for sharing uh, uh, this with us. Uh, you wrote uh, on the 7th of September that uh, I'm, and a quote here, I'm telling you people that the situation in Europe is uh, much worse than many understand. We are essentially on the brink of another banking crisis, a collapse of our industrial base and households, and thus uh, on the brink of a, the collapse of our economies. Uh, we are also totally at the mercy of the authorities, and we have uh, very little knowledge what they have planned. Uh, 
and and then there was a recommendation for you, an investment uh, portfolio, let's say, uh, which uh, consists of five uh, items, uh, which are cash, uh, and then food, water, wood, and other uh, necessities. Uh, so my que it's a very rosy, very rosy uh, perspectives. My question is, uh, uh, why do you think uh, that a cold winter is coming, and why do you think that the situation is so grave? Well, um, when the war started, in, in uh, late February, we actually, I actually, uh, we warned that uh, the war might come on the 12th of February, and we started to think, imagine the scenarios that how they would play out. And it basically centered on the idea that, okay, the European Union will most likely respond with some tough sanctions, and Russia will respond. And what they will probably do is that they will cut off the, the gas supply to the Europe. And when you start to, then you want to start to look uh, how different countries in Europe use gas, then the picture of, of a really troubling times starts to emerge. But it's actually, this story starts a bit further away uh, from the 2008 financial crisis when the uh, federal, the good people, let's say, at the Federal Reserve decided that they should uh, ease the stress in the financial markets by buying the government bonds of the U.S. federal government. And this set in motion a, a, a policy among central banks called the quantitative easing. And when that was not enough, they also got the interest rates to zero. And this was, these measures were basically kept in place and uh, in some points even enlarged for over 10 years. And to any economist, if you think that people are basically giving you free money, you know it leads to massive speculation in, across all the asset classes. So, and then coming back to our like, forecast in, the, in, the for, in, in February, you think of all the asset bubbles, all the massive asset bubbles, and you think how the likely sanctions will basically draw of the floor out of the European economy. How will this play out? It, well, the only kind of reasonable answer to that is it will be an epic collapse. Everything will collapse. And they, um, that's basically my tweet there. Uh, it went actually a bit viral. I think it is over five million views or something. So yeah, that, well, anyway. But that is the worst case scenario where you, we have the collapse of the first, the, you know, the energy infrastructure in Europe, the banking, infra, the financial infrastructure, banking, uh, political systems, uh, and, you know, currencies, all that. So that's a, a kind of an end of the world scenario, not that the world would end, but it would feel like that for a while. And they, um, it, in general, it's, it's, I think it's very important to think uh, development in scenarios, and that's the worst one. And the good one, where the, we have a truce and the gas flowing back to uh, Europe uh, through Nord Stream, that's gone. So we don't have the good scenario anymore. So we have maybe the middle one and then the horrific one. And in my thinking, it's usually that always prepare for the worst one. And that's why those things. Of course, there was a, quite a bit of black humor in that too, but people took it really literally. They were asking me, how, how can I buy wood from Finland? I said, I don't know. You know see, it, yeah. But we are the, I, I cannot stress enough how exceptionally dark the days ahead of that can be. If we have to change course now, or it will get really, really bad. Thank you very much for, for your insights, and I, I think that uh, even this answer gave us so many uh, things to, th uh, to, to, to consider and think about. And I would like to recommend to everybody, if, sorry I forget at the beginning, that uh, you can ask questions uh, on Slido. Uh, there is the, uh, the number which you should use to, uh, to make sure that these questions are arriving uh, at the right place. Um, and I would like to continue. Uh, uh, to talk to you, to talk with you, uh, and uh, and also you have uh, multiple times you have warned uh, about, uh, which is not a surprise after what you have uh, 
uh, told us uh, uh, now, but you have also warned about uh, the, the possibility of currency crisis. And in your opinion, which currencies are uh, having the highest risk uh, right now or, or in a potential uh, worst case scenario? Mm, well, I think the debate on that is over already. If you, if you look how the former reserve currencies of, of uh, Japanese yen and uh, British bound, how, how they have collapsed in the last few weeks, actually up to a point that the uh, Bank of Eng England needed to kind of get back into the uh, secondary markets of the guilds or the uh, um, British government bonds. We can actually, I can have a few words about that because that is very dramatic. So, but what we have been, our worst case here, of course, is the breakup of the Eurozone, which would be a, uh, you know, currency crisis of never before seen proportions with very many unknowns. And they, um, what I fear is that at the end, if, if we continue on this path, you know, with the war and sanctions and all, we will get there while the, while the euro breaks up. And then we, are, then we would be in totally uncharted waters with no idea what's, what's going to happen next. So, and unfortunately, we did, <laughs> did some research on how to leave or how to break up the euro a bit earlier. But the thing is that we are, this cannot be emphasized enough. We are in the midst of a very, very uh, rare and, and um, dangerous, let's say, events now with the currencies of former, like, really respected countries collapsing, financial, financial markets in the brink of collapse, and warmongering, you know, political chaos, all that. It just, if you look at this from very far, you can see this different kind of, uh, um, let's say, troubling aspects converging to something we have been calling the perfect storm. So, but yeah, anyway, but the, the main point there was that we are, we are really worried that Euro will collapse. Thank you very much. And uh, regarding the, the collapse of, of the Eurozone or the, uh, the breakup of the, of the Euro, uh, you wrote that uh, you were formerly a uh, semi supporter of the euro but uh, but right now at the time uh, when you wrote that uh, uh, article you said that you are a full blown uh, skeptic euro skeptic uh, when has this changed and has it something to do with the recent uh, situation with the war or was this before uh, the recent events well there are actually i think there are three you know uh, times when i or paths or points time points through which I went to get to this. And the first one was, a, uh, of course, the uh, debt crisis of, of Eurozone, which is actually a banking crisis, just masked as a debt crisis, so we could bail out the German and French banks. Yeah, yeah, yes, please. And that kind of got me thinking. I was just, I just uh, had my dissertation, and I, uh, I was a young you know, postdoctoral sc scholar, and I was thinking of what is going on here. And then in 2013, a, Professor Vesa Kanyan asked me to join Euro Think Tank, so which we critically analyzed the path of the Euro and its future. And in it, it was my task as a young researcher to, uh, to uh, look, go through the literature on monetary unions. And rather quickly, I, re I realized that all, they all come to the same conclusion, which is that for a large currency union to survive, you will need a political union, a transfer union, where those who benefit from being in a currency union uh, subsidize those who don't. And this was a big revelation to me. So I understood that in no way, in, in, under no cir circumstances, will the euro survive as it is. And there's actually, you know, like, and then, then I understood that there will be a breaking point when we have to choose other than the Eurozone breaks, or then we go into the kind of the Federal Union. And a, uh, in the US, this actually happened in the 1930s, great, during the 1930s Great Depression, when the Federal Union was forced to enact income transfers from, from, uh, from the federal, federal level to the, like the ailing states. And this moment uh, basically came in, in the Eurozone, in uh, 2020. And when they proposed the recovery fund, I knew that this was the point. 
This was the point after which there would be really hard for us to turn back to the original idea of the euro, which was just a you know, free currency union. And yeah, and there's a, those three points in history is, is what kind of turned me into full Eurosceptic. Because now there, there's a saying among me and a few critical thinkers in, in the Euro think tank that the recovery fund opened the door to a federal union and the next package, which will come, if we accept that, then there will be a federal EU. And federal unions do not break without wars, basically. So we are at the, you know, the, what's the word? Uh, when, well, we have opened the door. And if we step in and close it, then we're done. And Eurozone is a, a federal union of sorts. And we are at that crossroads now. And I don't think it's good for Europe that we'll, we will build a, a federal union here. And how good is it, is it for, for your country, for, uh, for Finland? What is your opinion on that? So would it be, because mm. I, I think that Finland is uh, one of the more advanced countries uh, and, and your debt levels are also uh, better than, uh, than those of, uh, of some of the countries. Uh, so if, if the Eurozone would break up into two parts, like uh, some countries which are more stable uh, and more uh, similar, let's say, uh, would that work for Finland in your opinion? or? Uh, I, I no, guess no, I know no. the answer, but... No. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, the, the, our economy, we're an export-dependent economy. And we have the such a specialty that we export uh, investment goods, whether they are uh, machine works or wood. And they are... Uh, basically, uh, our neighbor, Sweden, has a bit the same export structure. It's a bit wider, but about the same. And what we have noticed now is that while Sweden has been growing, the GDP has been growing, our, our has been stagnant since 2008. And only plausible explanation is that it's a currency. And the thing is that what uh, Finland is a, a currency that flex uh, among our, uh, with our needs. So if you think about when you have a, re a global recession, for example, and then the corporations are looking for investment goods. They will look for the price. And if I have our own currency, it would have depreciated a lot, and then we would have strong de demand coming from outside supporting our economy. And this is how our economy kind of proceed for a long time until the euro. So basically, yeah, it, euro is not good for Finland. And if they say it was a truly a, a sad thing that we were taking in, in it. And what, what's your opinion on the, on the possibility of leaving uh, the Eurozone? Greece was trying to do that uh, uh, under Varoufakis. They had plans to, to exit the Eurozone, but it would have been very, very hurtful for them because they had a lot of debt uh, denominated in Euros, which obviously if you leave, leave the Eurozone, have your own currency, but your debt remains in a stronger uh, currency. It's, it's a big problem. It's not the same for Finland, as I know, uh, but uh, how possible is it uh, to to have uh, to go back to uh, to having your own currency, in your opinion? Well, it's not actually so difficult. Like a, uh, there's this thing called a, a, it's an un, kind of a, um, international. Well, it's not a law, but it's a, it's a law like practice called lex monetai, which means that every country, every government can decide the currency they use to pay back debt unless there are different uh, kind of agreements on it. So when Greece, in 2015, I actually knew this rather well how it went, because my friend James Galbright from the uh, Texas University of Austin was, was the man who led the small team who planned for the exit of Greece from the euro. And they, uh, they had basically everything figured out. And the debt issue, well, that was not the big issue. Only thing was that how they can keep the banking system standing. That was the biggest thing. But the in most interesting thing is that Greece was actually offered a way out. This is, this is not the public knowledge, but it did. Ger Germany was even proposing a package uh, through the EU to Greece, which they would need when it leaves. But uh, for... <laughs> Well, interesting coincidence, we happened to be in Greece in 2015 in summer. 
And when the, you know, the uh, European Central Bank, Bank closed down the emergency liquidity assistance, which was unconstitutional, un, you know, e against everything that central banks should stand for. But it caused the banking crisis there. And while the banks closed, I, I talked to a lot of people on how they see the situation. And one of the, the basically the most interesting conversations came with investors who told me that they have a lot of money abroad, just waiting that the Greece will default, leave the euro, the currency will depreciate by 50%, then they will bring the money back, buy everything, invest and all that. And this is how it works in economic crisis. You let the currency crash, you default, and after you get investments flowing in. And that's the kind of the market-based a solution to the breakup of the euro. So actually, when you look at it a bit further, sure there would be would have been a, a really difficult period for Greece for maybe one or two, three years. But after that, I'm betting that the growth would have been phenomenal, really massive. So it's not really, it's not really, the, the leaving euro is not a technical issue. It's a political issue. There are technical difficulties, sure, but it's a political decision. And I have came to the, uh, we actually in the team have come to the conclusion that it's the political capital that is tied to Euro, which keeps it standing. Europe cannot, you know, admit that we failed on this or something like that. But it's, a, uh, it's truly plausible to leave the Euro. It's, it's, it's not a, it's not a, it would not be a catastrophic thing, that's for sure. I totally see your point, and thank you very much for, for uh, sharing this with us. Uh, my question would be uh, related to, uh, to this fund that I totally understand why uh, the investors can avoid the problems. Yes, they keep their uh, investments abroad, and then when the currency is already weak, then uh, they can bring uh, converted money back to uh, their home currency. But the average uh, Greek probably is, uh, will, won't do this. So what do you think, what is, the, what is the downside or what is the negative uh, consequence, what would have, would have been the negative consequence of, uh, of uh, Greece uh, reintroducing the drachma or, or a new drachma? Uh, would, because I, in my opinion, some wealth or some uh, savings of, of, of the average Greek people would have been wiped out or decimated at least. Uh, or, or do you agree or disagree? Well, the first, of course, there would have been, been a hit on the... Um purchasing power, you know, in, in, in foreign currency wise, so they wouldn't be able to buy as much stuff from abroad. But once again, the hit would have been hard, but I think it would have been compensated at the period of just, you know, two years maybe, when they would have seen the economy growing faster, currency getting stronger. So I think it would have been temporary, as it usually has been when currency unions have break up. It, it, they haven't been really drastic events. So they, they have been rather smooth going when, when planned well. So, well, of course, there are some exceptions, like the breakup of the Soviet Union, but there was, uh, there was all other, all, and the ru ruble union that followed it. But there is really, it, it would, like, every, well, we know this in life, every bad decision, if continued long enough, will have its consequences. And you will just have to bear the pain and go through it. And that's it. So that's, that's, how, how, that's how we should treat economies and economic crises too. They are an essential part of the cycle of life and the economy, and we just need to let them go through and survive, because they will create much more, much better things. That's, that's, that's how recessions and crises work, if done properly. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. You have convinced me that uh, uh, then for Greece it would have been better. And... Uh, What's your opinion on the, on the situation of Germany? Because you have uh, uh, mentioned that Germany was also proposing a plan. Uh, and there are people who are saying that the, the big success of the euro, for, I mean, for Germany, euro was a very successful project because, uh, because if Germany would have kept the Deutschmark, then obviously that would have been very, very strong. But since uh, the euro is a currency of a common currency of different countries, which are the most of them are not so advanced or not so strong as uh, uh, not having as strong economy as, as Germany. Germany can have a weaker currency, which can boost the exports of, of Germany. So obviously, if just one country leaves, it's maybe not a big problem. But is it not bad for, in your opinion, is it not bad for Germany if the eurozone breaks up? Of course. 
Yeah, Germany has been the biggest benefactor of the euro, and that's why they want to keep it. And the, but the thing is that if you really benefit of something, like having a currency of like Southern Europe country when you are the power hub, or used to be the power hub of, of, uh, of Europe, then you need to give something back. And Germany hasn't really done that. So that's the thing. Germany has acted, I think, very selflessly on this. And they, um, yeah, I don't know. And now, now, now they are probably even suffering from their own stubbornness with the, all the all that is coming to the um, gas issues and all. But I think, yeah, Germany, Germany was offered the role, I think, to lead Europe to prosperity once again. But it didn't take it, and that's a tragedy of itself, I think. And uh, besides Germany, who, who is, uh, in your opinion, who was the winner of this uh, Euro project? And as a side question, uh, would you recommend us Hungarians to join the Eurozone? <laughs> I, I was, I was, you know, this was my initial question. I wanted to ask only the, this part, but then I, I thought that maybe it's obvious for all of us that uh, what your answer will be. So I, I decided to, to have uh, another, uh, to include another question. Uh, who, who else is benefiting in your opinion? They, they, I think, was it Jens Nordwijk or a former Nomura chief economist? Some, someone did some calculations on, on the GDP, you know, with and without Euro who have benefited. And I don't, it was Germany and Netherlands, Austria, but they were all really small compared to the benefits of Germany. I think it was something like GDP growth of like 20% more since uh, till was it 2013 or something? So Germany is the sole biggest benefactor, and, and the rest, I don't know, it's maybe friends, they have gotten some, I don't know, support or you know, of their self-esteem or something that being the same currency with Euro, I don't know, but in economic, in economic sense, it's, it's mostly just, a, uh, just Germany. I see. And, and, do, not, and do, do, do not join the Euro. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I, I agree with you. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I don't. We are, I mean, theoretically, we have to introduce what? it. Uh, what, but what, unfortunately, no, what? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's fortunate for us that we haven't entered the Eurozone yet. So we have still uh, the option to, you know, uh, wait uh, longer. So theoretically, we have to introduce it um, at some time. But uh, but there's no deadline, so I, I really think that uh, based on what you have mentioned and based on what I have uh, read and, uh, and researched, I, I, I agree with you that uh, maybe that's not the best for the younger, at least at the present state of the economy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you have specialized in uh, both, uh, in many, many things, but, uh, but the first two which were mentioned on the, uh, on the homepage of uh, GNS is economic growth and uh, economic crisis. And, I fear I know your answer, but I, I wanted to ask you, uh, because you are here, uh, which, which specialization will be more important in the upcoming years, in your opinion? Well, I think they will go in this order. There's, there's also central banks, so economic crisis, central banks, economic growth. So first we need to understand where we're going. Then we need to understand how to fix central banks, because they are in the heart of this mess that is coming. And then concentrate on the policies creating prosperity, EA creating economic growth. So I think if you master those three traits, then it's good. And do you have a do you have a agenda time plan for for this? Uh, how long are we? How long will we have the the crisis part? And uh... well, we have a, a special report, report coming out. It's it's on the it says on the title that on the economic collapse of 2020 to 2025. So we are expecting that this will get into the bottom in, in let's say, next uh, uh, three years. But the thing here is, which, which I worry, uh, and which kind of uh, hinders our ability to see what's coming, is that we don't know the uh, responses of authorities. So I don't think many of you probably don't know, but yesterday, was the day that the global financial system almost collapsed. There was a uh, massive run on the liabilities of pension funds in Great Britain and United Kingdom. 
And at noon about, uh, Bank of England uh, st stated that they will start buying the, the long-term bonds of, of, uh, of um, uh, British government again. Basically, they were stepping into the market again. And there was a big hassle in, in the finance Twitter and, and finance of what is going on. And later today, it was found out that it was actually that if, if the if General Bank hasn't, wouldn't have done that, they, uh, many of the pension funds of the Britain would have been insolvent in that afternoon. Yeah, that's, that's massive. And this is the point of financial speculation where we have, you know, come to. And these close calls, there will be more to come. And what I wonder is that can the authorities really stop every front, everything of this from escalating? Because we are walking a tightrope now. And if we, fall, if we fall, then we're gone for a while. It should be remembered that the world does not end if the financial system collapses, but it will be extremely uh, unpleasant for a while. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gumas. Uh, this was, as I understood, it was a, it was a positive uh, story about central bankers when they saved the, uh, I mean, or was it not? Uh, yeah, kind of. They, they, in this case, the Bank of England acted as the lender of last resort, basically saving a day. But the problem is that they have created this mess, a mess at the first place. So, yeah, it, it's, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, it's, it doesn't, you know, if, 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 let's say that you have spent a night out making mess of everything, and then in the morning you wake up and notice, that, oh, oh God, I screwed up. And it doesn't really help you to drink more. It gives you a bit of a relief, but the, you know, the, everything that is smashed is still there. So this is about the same thing. You don't, you don't fix problems with that, getting back to the, uh, was it off or on the wagon? But anyway, it doesn't help. So this is the same thing, that, that really the um, financial markets ha have become addicted to the uh, cheap liquidity provided by the central banks. And that's not, that's not how market economies should work. This is, this is central planning beyond what we saw in the Soviet Union, basically. So it's, it's, we are in extremely dangerous waters here. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, I just wanted to, to mention uh, to you that uh, regarding this example uh, with, with drinking, that in Hungary we, have, we used to say that uh, uh, the dog bite can be healed by the hair of the dog. So if you, if you drink too much, then tomorrow you should drink as well. And I have friends who have... Uh, this very strong opinion that it uh, it really helps. I I for me it was never working. So I, I rather and I, uh, I no, don't no, no 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 no. I was referring that you were you you really made a mess that day yesterday evening broken something. You know you cannot you, you cannot fix that by drinking more. I understand. Okay, that part is completely but, clear. And I, uh, I I really think that the economic uh, analogy was perfect. So I totally agree with you that uh, that money printing can work for a while, but on the longer term. It can create... Uh, it's big. always a horrible, horrible idea. Exactly. Do not print money. <laughs> I mean, okay, maybe maybe if after the 2008-9 financial crisis, uh, QE was working. Okay, yeah, I'll give you that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, but I wanted to quote you uh, from two years ago. Uh, so, so right now, you had some uh, positive opinion about central bankers. Uh, I mean, half positive, let's say. In a way, in a way, uh, I mean, more positive than this one, than this quote, for sure. Okay, you said uh, two years ago that uh, central bankers are trying to steal uh, the rest of our already diminished economic freedom. Uh, they absolutely uh, need to go. Uh, so, so do you think that the system without central bankers could work? Or do you think that, that the policies which central bankers were doing in the last, I mean, between 2010 and 2020 uh, was, uh, was uh, not the right uh, direction? Economy, uh, or ec let's say economic relations are about 5,000 years old, what we know of. Central banks have been around since maybe 1700, 1600, around. And the US Federal Reserve was created in 1914. 
And of course, there were bigger crises in the US before that. But 16 years after the creation of the Fed started the biggest financial economic crisis ever seen, the Great Depression. So, and the argument was back in the day that you need to have a central bank guiding the economy so that we don't get crisis. Well, that didn't go very well. And actually, the original idea of central banks um, was in, uh, it, it came around, I think it was the banking crisis in, uh, in Florence and um, uh, Venice, I think it was, in uh, 1340-something. And then they were talking that we would need a liquidity back backstopper, some entity giving liquidity to the banks that are in trouble. And this is the original idea of central banks. And now, now it's totally corrupted. So I'm not sure whether we can go back to that, uh, that idea, but only through crisis we can get to the point where we learn to operate without central banks, at least in their current you know, strength or uh, the current, their current ability to affect the economy. But this is something I and several others are all already thinking that how would the world without central banks work? It's, a, it's an interesting uh, exercise in imagination once again. Uh, and what would be the most challenging in, in that world, in your opinion? Or, or would it be just, it would be better in every sense? Or would there be some aspects of, of this world which would, uh, which would be challenging? Or, or... No, there's one interesting historical example very, from Finland, basically. So we had the massive financial crisis in early 1990s. And uh, there weren't enough resources to save all the banks. So banks failed, and there was very punitive recapitalization of banks. And what happened? When the 2008 crisis came, none of the Finnish banks failed. They, were, they weren't even close. They were, they were kept out. They kept out from the exotic you know, financial products. And the, the, the moral hazard, which basically states that you know, you, if you are big enough, you can do a lot of stuff because someone else will save you. That was gone. So the thing is that we would need, we need to absolutely need to learn without someone watching our back all the time. And the only, basically the most challenging thing, the only thing I think is, is hindering this idea of not being with, uh, not operating the ec economy not w without central bank is just a liquidity backstopper. But there are solutions to that too. But we have to, because we are, we are faced with this, we are at crossroads now, basically. Other one goes to the kind of a full centralized control of our economies to the central bank digital currencies. Other, ones, other one takes us to freedom, but to crisis. So there is a, uh, and when we go to the full economic control, then we lose you know, our freedoms, basically. So I cannot, I cannot stress that either, that how crucial these selections within the next few years are. This is truly, we are in the, in the midpoints of history now. We are making history as we speak. Every decision we make from hence, henceforth, both nationally and personally, will be marked in the history books. So we are really in, in, a, in an exceptional time in history. So you have to remember that. I totally see your point, uh, Thomas. Thank you very much. And I would, I would be curious, what is your opinion on, on the great moderation? Because, uh, because you have mentioned that central banks are not very old, uh, totally true, and, and central banks were not having the, the sorry, best... Sorry, sorry to stop. Are you really okay. going to ask me about great moderation with inflation running in double digits? Yeah, yeah, I wanted, okay. to, I wanted to continue with this, this one, actually. So my question would be, uh, my question would be, and, and for, for, for everybody uh, who is not... Uh, uh, familiar with the concept of great moderation. So after 1980, uh, 1980 uh, the Volcker, uh, the, the head of the American Central Bank, he was very successful in pushing down inflation levels and making the economy much more stable than it was before. And, uh, and everybody believed that, uh, that we have a new era where central bankers, they know everything and they are all powerful. And obviously, yeah, totally right that uh, I, I totally agree with you that the 2008 night financial crisis was actually, you know, uh, showing us that this belief was not very uh, founded, maybe. Uh, and, and also the recent situation is, uh, is, uh, is actually showing us that, uh, that, that, uh, that belief was uh, maybe uh, unfounded. But, uh, 
My question would be, do you think that uh, it was successful for a while, but then uh, something went wrong? Uh, so what, what was, were there anything which was uh, in Europe? OK, <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> it was the great moderation was creation of China. We pushed all our kind of uh, outsourced or most of our production there, and they they product they produced products cheap. So it, it it is a success story of Chinese rising from the poverty, and central banks had very little to do with that. That's that's my opinion because at that time you know uh, uh, Greenspan was uh, just concentrated on uh, you know bailing out the financial system whenever it's almost crashed. So I don't yeah I think yeah, and I think. After what has happened now, I think we can just throw the great moderation debate out of the window. It, it didn't. It wasn't what it, it's supposed to be, or what or what we thought it would be. I see your point. And do you, do you think that this uh, this process will uh, reverse? That uh, that we were outsourcing everything. Uh, yeah, it's totally true. Uh, not Hungary, but but the U.S. Uh, and also parts of the, of Western Europe. Do you think that this process will reverse and? Uh, and production will come back from China, from uh, from uh, other places to 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 be closer. It's all, it's already happening, and we have to we have to be more local from henceforth. I think globalization went a bit too far, as it usually always goes. This is, I think, the third or the fourth way of globalization, so nothing new. It will just have the most dire consequences, probably. Uh, but. Um, yeah, let's see. But we have to have to start producing stuff more locally, and it should be more also the globalization between people, not just corporations and governments. So people seeking and small companies seeking partners abroad. I, I think we have to rethink how we how we run our economies from henceforth. And uh, and while this is a very good news, I think uh, regarding the employment in Europe, the employment in, in the U.S. Uh, obviously, if this is the, uh, uh, the, the opposite of the great moderation, uh, then probably this will, uh, as a result, we will have high inflation figures for longer. Or what is your opinion on that? So will we have high inflation figure? I mean, right now, obviously, the war and, uh, and the shortage in uh, mainly gas uh, is, is obviously having a big impact on the inflation figures. But obviously, this uh, reshoring is... is uh, driving up the prices, driving up inflation, driving up the cost of production as well. Do you think that we will have a high inflation period for the next uh, decades? I think for the next at least three to five years, possibly even a deca decade. It's, it a lot, all basically depends on how we act now, from this point on. What, do we, what, what kind of policies we choose and all that. So um, it, it's, a, it's a complex picture. But we can ha we can have easily a decade of high inflation, but I'm hoping we get we get we we be able to shorten that quite a bit. But it's it's upon us now how we what we decide what we do. I see, and how this will impact uh, uh, the inequalities, or uh, what's your opinion on that? So will will it grow in the upcoming years? Will it be? Smaller. Well, um, while I was still in the academia, I I, I refereed an interesting paper who, which looked at the at big crisis, how they affected the inequality, and it actually, if I remember the result correctly, it, crisis tend to bring inequality down because it draws the uh, kind of a financial excess or it crashes it. So all who have money to speculate on, on, on asset markets will lose it, and it will inequality will diminish at least at the aggregate level. But I think it will go that way too, because the, the great financial wealth built with the help of central banks are crashing as we speak. So it will change the inequality for the better. But of course, if, if, if we have a, a serious banking crisis and a uh, economic collapse, then we have, of course, poverty increase and all that. So it's difficult to assess how it will go at this point. I see. And how can, how can normal families prepare for, for the upcoming years or decades besides buying food, water, and, uh, and warm clothes? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Well, I've been telling people for the past three years that try to get rid of all your debt 
debt in a crisis situation, you, uh, when you have a lot of debt and, and there's a banking crisis, you are basically a slave. That's what we learned in the, in the 1990s banking crisis of Finland. You will be, your debt will not go away. It will just sold, be sold. If the bank fails, it will, be, it will be sold to another party. And you don't know what the interest rate is. So first, try to do that. It's a bit late already, I, I know. Then you should have some amount of cash at home, small den denominated bills. Uh, I said in, uh, in, in euros in, and dollars in five, ten, twenties. Uh, uh, that doesn't really help in, in Hungary, I think. So you have to have, what, 500, to 1,000? Anyway, but small demonic bills. And of, of course, now if you have a lot of cash, uh, the inflation will lead away. So that's it. This is a tricky choice now. But the thing is that if a banking crisis hits, it hits also to the financial architecture, which means that your cards may not work all the time and your digital payments will not work. That's why you need cash. So I urge everyone to just have some, uh, uh, let's say two weeks worth of cash at home. Then you are, then you are covered. Because if you know governments let banking crisis without you know financial system working run for more than two weeks, then we are all buggered, basically. So, but that's that's something you can do, and of course have wood and wa water and <laughs> food. Yeah, but I noticed that you are that you are. I don't know much about Hungarian economy, but you are a, a agricultural exporter. So at least you don't have to worry about you know running out of food, which is good. I, I really agree with you. I'm fortunate that this, uh, this will be a very, very important uh, factor uh, in, in the future. And, uh, and who, which, which country, I mean, oh, sorry, uh, so, so leaving the Eurozone, you wrote uh, a detailed plan for Finland, how they can uh, exit uh, the Eurozone. Uh, how, how, is, uh, how do you see the situation in Finland or, or the public opinion regarding the Euro? Do Finnish people like uh, or they, do, they, do they agree with you or do they see the economic uh, impact of having the euro? Uh, well, European Union is, is many things, but it's also one of the most efficient propaganda machines we have seen in Europe since the 1940s, basically. So we've been told all the time, especially to Finns, that euro is good. European Union is good. Everything is good. And regarding this, the public opinion basically is for the euro quite strongly. But if, if people would have, if, if our media would really tell people how destructive the euro has been, I think that it, that would change. And then Finnish would want to exit. And they are, yeah. But we'll see. Now, now, I, I think we have bigger problems now. But I would like to see, when the crisis is done and the new growth begins, I would like to see Finland outside Europe because then we could really rip the benefits of our own currency in the new, kind of a new world that emerges from the old. And, uh, and what should, uh, which company should we follow in Finland? Because when I, when I was in, as, uh, as young or as old as our students here at MCC, I was, uh, everybody had the Nokia phone. Nokia was uh, uh, the best company we could have imagined and we were very, uh, we are envying uh, Finland uh, very much uh, because of that. Is there any Finnish company right now in your opinion which we should accept? Uh, I mean, GNS is one of them and, uh, and I'm following <laughs> Actually, it. Yes. But, and, uh, and really, thank you very much for, for, for all the information you have mm -hmm. shared with us and uh, and uh, with the internet as well. Uh, but uh, which, which other Finnish company could uh, be the next big thing in your opinion? I, I think I would say forestry companies because they are investing a lot in, in creating different stuff from, from, from the wood. For example, something to replace plastic with. So there, there might be some really major breakthroughs coming from them. So that's my five cents on that. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we have great questions as well. Uh, some of them are even better than mine, so I would like to uh, share uh, a few of them uh, with you. Uh, and uh, the very first is, uh, uh, do you think that the economic crisis will lead to the abolition of uh, cash? Well, yeah, that's, that's one of the scenarios we could end up to. 
if we if we give into the pressure of the central banks, give them the digital currencies, give give them our digital freedoms, then they will have to take the cash away, because the cash is the only mean to respond to a central bank, for example, setting an interest rate of minus ten or whatever at will. And this is actually, I have to men, uh, mention this on the central bank digital currencies that even the acad in academic literature, in published paper, they papers they warn about this threat of losing our economic freedom if the central bank digital currencies come to life. So if that happens, they will try to abolish cash. I just hope we go the other way and do not let them. Because the money is a simple creation. It's just what we agree is money is money. So it's, it's, based, uh, it's based on a, on a public trust that something is money. So we can, let's say here, we can say, OK, we use this currency. Let's say, well, whatever, the flowers of that plant or whatever. We can, we can really imagine every kind of form of money we want. It just has to follow certain principles, which I'm not going to go now. But the point is that they have an imaginary control, central banks and the governments, on our economies through issuing their the, uh, uh, currencies of uh, uh, illegal tenders. But we really, we really can set up new currencies, and this is actually what the cryptocurrencies are doing. They are an op the opposite in force to the CPDCs. Actually, you, I don't know, you just not just invented the time travel to go back and, and work so much every day, but you also uh, see my question somehow. I don't uh, know how is it possible, because the next question I want to... <laughs> The next question I wanted to ask you is uh, exactly about uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, and I, I see your point, I understand your point regarding uh, CBDC. What's your opinion on cryptocurrencies? Uh, because, yeah, as you told us, that uh, we can decide whether we would use this or that, or, uh, and cryptocurrencies are a viable option. Uh, do, you, do you think that uh, this is one way to keep our freedom? And if, if so, then... Do you like uh, stable coins better, or, or Bitcoin, or uh, what should we buy? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I think that the most of the majority of the cryptocurrencies are, are just speculative assets. But uh, the blockchain technology, for example, is an excellent way of creating a payment system, and that should be used. And they, um, I don't know whether, s but it's, it's like I said, we can decide if we want to use some cryptocurrency as, as, as our money. But Money should have especially one thing. It should be stable in value. It cannot fluctuate like most cryptocurrencies do. So we have to ag agree on that first. But they are, at the current time, they are really the opposing force of central bank digital currencies. And in that, that way, they play a very important role in this battle, if you may, of our economic freedoms. I see. Uh... Another very good question which was uh, asked is that uh, obviously you, you told very, very clearly that, uh, that you don't think that uh, entering the Eurozone for Hungary is a great uh, uh, or a good idea right now. But uh, can you imagine any, any circumstance or any stage at which uh, it could be beneficial for, for, for any, I mean, I don't expect to, to know every macro data about Hungary right now, but, uh, but my question would be that, can you imagine that for, for at some level it can be beneficial for a country to, to introduce the euro? When you outgrow Germany, then you can join. I see, okay. Then maybe not tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, on, on the other hand, you have also mentioned that uh, when we talked about, when we talked about uh, the example of Greece, even when you talked about Finland, that, uh, that having the, an own currency which can weaken, let's say, uh, against the, the euro, can, that can be beneficial for, for exports, that can be beneficial for the, for the GDP and employment. Uh, and right now what we can see that the, the dollar is strengthening a lot against the euro, um, so, so what do you think? Is this, uh, is this evolution helping the European economy? Is, is this a good news for, for Europe? No, it's a... Uh, well, uh, for past 100 years almost, when there is a crisis coming, uh, 
investors hedge themselves by going in the dollars. And this is what's happening. It's not a euro. Japanese yen is collapsing. Like I said, pound is collapsing. All the emerging currencies are collapsing. So, well, sure, it helps euro in a uh, euro countries in the sense that okay, we have now a, a, a what's it um, cheaper currency. But where we are heading, I don't think it it helps quite a bit now because there may be even speculation in the fall of euro of its breakup of its demise. So I, I would not celebrate on that now. I see. I see. And unfortunately, I agree with you. Um, what, which country can profit from, from the recent situation then, in your opinion? Because, I mean, we all only talked about losers, uh, if I understood you uh, correctly. So can there be a winner or what should change, uh, in your opinion, or, or what should change in policy, what should change in, in actions to... Uh, to have winners and not just losers in, in uh, the upcoming years? Well, actually, now I think that if you pr produce raw materials, which includes food, for example, you are in a good place in this coming, coming crisis. Or, well, basically, it has already started. That, and then, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So raw materials will be appreciated heavily. But then there's always, always been, like, countries, if you, if you can read the times correctly, the times I mean, and, and see what the world needs next, if you can design, manufacture and export that, you will be highly successful. So like Finland, it rose from the 1990s banking crisis with the help of our currency depreciation. But then came Nokia. We didn't invent it. Like it was not a government plan that we got Nokia. It just came here. And then just, whoosh, we went a, a massive growth spree after that. So if you can find that, the next big trend, the mega trend that will feed, the, you know, not feed the world, but will feed into the world, that is way to do, a, a, to gain pros a massive amount of prosperity without being a, a raw material uh, producer and exporter. I see. Another question uh, regarding uh, a topic we, we talked about, uh, the, uh, the situation in Greece. And obviously, uh, this question is uh, related to uh, the hypothetical case that if uh, Greece would have left the Eurozone, uh, that the, what would have been the consequence uh, on the debt rating, credit rating uh, of the country, in your opinion. So would that... Well, very detrimental at first, naturally. They, they have would have gone into default, and they, uh, nothing, nothing nice would have come out of that. But the point in this situation is it, you, you do not look the first one or two years. You look what lies behind, and there is the growth. And it always goes like, if you, if you look at economic crisis in history, if you let your currency devalued, if you default on your debt, if you restructure your debt, and then, then you have like legislation for a personal bankruptcy and stuff like that, you will emerge from there as a winner. That's a given thing. Really, the, really that will happen. And now we are probably seeing on it on a global scale. So we have to like, understand that there is too much debt in the world. And, uh, and I don't think debt forgiveness will do it. This is, this is going to be a massive default event, and it has to be. But then the slide is clean, and the, all the like, you know, creditors who have provided the debt will be, let's say, more wiser of you know, giving out loans in, in the future. This is how it should go. Natural purging of, of the kind of the rotten core of the economy. This is how it has always gone through crisis in history. This is just a bigger one than anyone, than anything before, but the means to go through it are the same. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Thomas. And uh, you have mentioned that your ex-wife has uh, said that you you are similar to Fox Mulder from X Files. Uh, for me, you are more similar to Tim Robbins in Shawshank Redemption, and the young uh, Tim Robbins, uh, as you look. And also, he was a financial mastermind. As it, when I first watched the movie, 
I only thought it's just about a prison outbreak and uh, stuff like that. But actually, it was a financial mastermind, uh, as, as you are as well. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing uh, your thoughts uh, with us. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for, for uh, giving, uh, giving us your time and being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. It was good to be here. And, and, they, um, and we continue here also. But the last word I want to say to all the you know, people here, especially the one, one, young ones, remember to be brave. From there, all greatness arises. Be brave. Thank you. Thank you.